Hey everyone, my name is Lily and I'm the book blogger behind Utopia State of Mind and today I'm going to share with you some of my favorite 2021 YA fantasy reads. So this was an interesting group because I had a ton that were debut authors, a ton that were sequels. I'm going to split those into different groups because there were a lot. Um, I don't have all of the YA fantasy books that uh, I read, but I have most of them actually. And I'm getting the, the thing out. So. These are all of them. These are not all of them, sorry. I don't know why I said that. These are a lot of them right here, but these are not all of them. So I'm gonna chat first about some that I don't have with me, and then I'm going to chat about these ones. The first one is The Cost of Knowing. This is by Brittany Morris. Basically, this is a book about a black teen. I'm reading this from, from Goodreads, by the way, but a black teen who has the power to see into the future, whose life turns upside down when he foresees his younger brother's imminent death. So Alex, when he, ha he has this power where when he touches objects, he can like see into the future, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, he sees into the future. So basically when he touches um, his girlfriend's hand, he sees an image of them breaking up. That's obviously very um, emotionally upsetting to him. And also when he touches a photo, he then gets a vision of his brother's imminent death. And so he now is like racing against time to figure out if he can stop that from happening. But what I really loved about um, The Cost of Knowing is, ha first of all, that magical world building, like magical power thing is just so intriguing. I feel like it was one of those things where it's very clear why it could be a blessing and a curse. You know, like there that that's a lot to unpack there. But um, what I really loved about The Cost of Knowing is that it also looks at this idea of the future and if you could know like what was going to happen in the future how would that affect your future basically and how would that affect your actions and how you see people and how you see yourself that was one kind of thematic thing that i really loved and the second one was in general kind of just a theme about um that the cost of knowing really delves into which is like if you knew that things were going to end what would you do differently and how would you change right because i feel like we all know that like there's a possibility of a relationship ending. There's a possibility of someone that we love dying. There's possi you know there's a possibility of us dying. Like I think what the cost of knowing really kind of well described or well explored is this idea of taking this magical fantasy power of touching objects and seeing what the future was and like expanding that to also discuss kind of just general questions about loss and love and mortality and family and um, kind of your, your images of yourself as well. Um, so that was kind of what I loved the most about The Cost of Knowing. The next one is This Poison Heart. This is my Owl Crate edition of This Poison Heart, which is why it looks a little bit different. It's super reflective. It looks a little bit different than um, the normal cover. Um, what it is, I'm also going to read a little bit off of the inside flap because I don't want to get anything wrong, but Briseis has a gift and with, she can like touch plants and then they, she makes them grow basically. That's her magical power. So when her aunt dies, she is then inherits this like really intense estate in New York, in Rhinebeck or like near Rhinebeck. And as soon as she gets to this new house, she discovers a lot of different things about not only her powers, but a lot about her aunt and like a whole bunch basically. So I think what I really loved and what was easy to love um, this Poison Heart was how action packed it was and also how many twists there were. I have a really hard time talking about why I love this Poison Heart because so much of it is spoilery, okay? I think that the whole last third of it is kind of what cemented my love for this book. I can't talk about it and it really bothers me but anyway the main character is this really fascinating I love this idea of having the power to make things grow maybe it's because all of my plants in my apartment uh, currently are dying I don't have a green thumb I, I would need some help basically um, and so what I really love is this character journey but also how swept away I think I finished this one in a matter of days because I needed to finish it there's a lot of twists and turns for like just you know, hinty hints, there's a lot of magical lore, there's a lot of, you know, there that you can see some influences of, of Greek mythology, which I feel like is hard to talk about in relation to the book because everyone's like, oh, what do you mean? And then you're like, oh, I, I can't actually say. 
but I think it should be something that people should know about because I think the Greek mythology is kind of becoming a little bit trendy now. So, you know, there are vibes, good vibes in here. And a lot, it also asks about sacrifice and a lot about family um, and what you would sacrifice for family or what you have sacrificed and kind of mystery and secrets, tons and tons of action. Um, Kaylin also wrote um, Cinderella's Dead, which I just adored. And so I knew that I had super high hopes for this Poison Heart and nothing disappointed me. It was like halfway through, I knew this was gonna be a five star read. The next one on my list is Six Crimson Cranes. I have loved basically everything that Elizabeth Lim has written. Um, Six Crimson Cranes is kind of a mix between, um, the, what is it, the 12 Swan's Tale? I can't remember the exact name of the story, but um, the one where her brothers end up turning into swans. That story and a bunch of elements of Chinese mythology. So basically it says a princess in exile, a shape-shifting dragon, six enchanted cranes, and an unspeakable curse. It will take more than magic to find their right home. So basically, Shiori is a princess. And kind of like the folk tale that I was talking about with the cranes, she has wearing, um, she is warned that every word that utters her lips after she is, um, after her brothers are turning into cranes, that her brother, one of her brothers will die. So it's a lot about being robbed of your voice and a lot about how you can make a difference even if you don't have a voice and also about like the true bonds of family. There's also a lot of different other kind of stories and mythology and folk tales and everything woven into Six Crimson Cranes, which is another reason that I really loved it. And I just love this book so much because I felt like the character journey in it was, I, I hesitate to say relatable because I don't really feel like it necessarily is super relatable to like my life perhaps since I don't have any brothers, none of them are turning to cranes. But I thought it was really relatable in this idea of sacrificing for one's family and for really testing the limits of what our power and potential is, basically. She has magical powers, but she kind of keeps them under wraps, except on the day of her betrothal, she makes a mistake essentially, and then her stepmother, I think, finds out what her like what her magical powers were and so I really loved um, this story and the way that she has to figure out her own magical powers and her own magical journey. The next book is A Lesson in Vengeance. This is also my Owl Crate edition so that's why it's <laughs> brighter than the other one um, with also shimmery sparkly edges. Um, I'm a huge fan of Victoria Lee. Victoria Lee is one of my favorite authors. So, I mean, I had extremely high hopes for a lesson in vengeance and 100% where they paid off. Uh, first of all, I really loved the kind of this dark academia setting and meets also this kind of unreliability and unreliable narrator-esque. The suspense slash thriller vibes in this, like the suspense and mystery vibes in this and the way that you're kind of like trying to unravel what's happening a plus in here and I think that also kind of ties into this unreliability and maybe also a little, a little bit of unreliability of the narrator I'll let you you know make your own opinion but that's definitely one of the reasons why I loved A Lesson in Vengeance so if you are a fan of books with intense atmospheric vibes and like suspense and I just stress I was reading my review over again I just keep stressing the suspense and the unreliable narrator element but if you're a fan of that and you also really love a queer um fantasy then you definitely should read this i just okay this is one of my favorite sentences i think i've written in a review ever so i just want to share it i don't normally do this i don't normally like read you know the words from my reviews because i feel like if you wanted to read those words you could just follow my blog link in the description but this is one of my favorite sentences i think i've ever written a review and it says Lee slowly establishes this line of unreliability drawn in mirror fog, swirling sand, and on chalkboards. It's told in these in those ways where not even the characters can see the obscured footprints, the subtle whispers of breath on the back of their neck. A lesson in vengeance almost feels like you're walk you're watching one's descent into the darkness, into an eerie wood at twilight. That or seeing the tendrils of water and wind forming the eye of a storm. I rest my case. If you love that sentence and you love the vibes from that, you just need to pick up this book. The next one is A Clash of Steel by C.B. Lee. I'm a huge fan of C.B. Lee ever since the Not Your Sidekick 
books, which I cannot figure out where is on my, my, my bookshelf. But anyway, um, A Clash of Steel is a Treasure Island reimagining. Basically, it's one of the first two books that are kickstarting this new series, I guess, that Macmillan is doing, which are Classic Tales Remixed. I can't remember if that's the official title of the series, but it is a sapphic, um, historical fictionish fantasy. I wasn't really sure where to put it because like Treasure Island isn't necessarily like, <laughs> it's, it, you know, it's a story. Okay. So I wasn't sure where to, where to put it in the genre, but I, I put it in here. So basically if you didn't know about Treasure Island, or if you want to know more about this, I will read you from the synopsis. Um, it's about two intrepid girls which hunt for a legendary treasure on the deadly high seas. And yeah, it's a remix of the novel Treasure Island, which I've never read. But what I really loved about this one was not only the like vibes and the atmosphere, but I really loved how it talks about one of the, one of a, like a real legendary, um, I was gonna say pilot. I meant a real legendary pirate who's, I can't remember the name. It, it had a really fantastic author's note. But anyway, it's kind of like based roughly or loosely, I guess, on that story. First of all, I kind of love pirates. It's another one of my pet project, pet interests. Um, and because I really love pirates, I knew I had to read this. I'm a huge fan of C.B. Lee. I love the idea of remixing classics. And this one especially takes treasure hunting, pirate, deadly, like all of these different adventure things that are very present in Treasure Island, according to what I know about Treasure Island, and then inputs it into this other world with different characters, introduces some queerness. It has a lot about family and loyalty, um, a huge thing about like when family is trying to protect you, but then you don't want that protection because it doesn't feel like protection. It feels like someone's trying to like stop you from doing you what you want. Age old, age old universal kind of challenge. Um, but it talks a lot about that and it is so fun. I think that so far it may be my favorite of these remix classics. Gotta love pirates. The next one is Bones of Ruin. This just to like this defies description really, but basically it's about a high rope dancer. I can't remember if that's the name of it. Basically, she's not necessarily a tightrope. I mean, she's a tightrope walker, but she also does dancing and flips. And I okay, I've never really gone to I've never been to the circus at all. So I don't know like what the different types of people are um, that perform at circuses and specifically on tight ropes. But anyway, she's a tight rope dancer and she is cursed slash maybe blessed, we don't really know, by never being able to die. So that's kind of one of the first things that immediately drew me to this, to this book, not only like this fantastic fiery cover, but also that premise. But then what actually ends up happening sort of underneath that is then she gets invited to this competition which is super deadly okay a deadly competition between all these other fantastical people they have different fantasy abilities um so that's why it's like fantastical people they have different fantasy abilities and so everyone's kind of competing for whatever their heart desires the most and of course her heart desires most are answers because she can't remember anything behind or before like waking up at one point but she obviously lived before that, so she can't remember any of her past. And so she's looking for these answers, and she hopes that she will win them in the course of the contest. This is the beginning of a series, and it is a book that I need, like, the second of immediately, because I loved all of these different layers of premises that I loved. Tightrope dancing, walk, you know, living for not, not being able to die, a deadly competition, all of these different things. I was like, yes, yes, yes. Um, and I this. Even though this book was longer than I was expecting, I think it was like 500 pages, I just, I blew through it. I blew through it because I was so intrigued about her trying to figure out her origins um, as a transracial adoptee. I don't even know how many times I'm going to say that. I'm adopted. I don't know if anybody knew that. But um, origin stories and trying to find out one's origin and having that be a motivation rings super close to home, very much resonates with like me as a human being. And so her trying to go through this and like keeping her own past a secret, I guess, from certain people and having to maybe be on a team, but not sure if you can be on a team with someone because you don't know if you can trust them because they're strangers. All of these different things really resonated with me in a way that would never resonate with me in real life because I'm, I, I can die. I'm pretty sure would not be a type walker probably could not even manage in a deadly competition of just 
normal normal life so if you really love any of the things i just said you would kind of have to read the bones of ruin and then wait for the the, the sequel because i i cannot personally wait the next one is the girls are never gone by sarah glenn marsh sarah glenn marsh another auto by author i don't think any of these authors uh on this list were any that i like didn't know about which makes sense because i have a i have a different video that is going to be um why what is it gonna be I don't remember but basically I have a very small list of authors that are entirely new to me so I just I like reading the same things the same authors over and over again in the girls are never gone it features um, a main character named dare and dare doesn't believe in ghosts but she hosts I think a podcast a podcast for um, it's a paranormal investigation podcast. I wanted to make sure I got that right. A paranormal investigation podcast. And so then she ends up visiting this estate called Arrington Estate, where apparently there's like ghostly activity because I think she gets a tip into her podcast. So she ends up visiting there and supernatural ghosty stuff, you know, the line between is it really happening or not ensues. Um, so as I said before, Sarah Glenn Marsh is an autobi author. This also features diabetes rep. I'm pretty sure that Dare has diabetes. I'm pretty sure, but I can't remember like which character, but I'm pretty sure Dare has diabetes. It features diabetes rep, and what I really loved about it is that it is able to um, balance intense moments of horror and dread with joy and also love um, because there's also a queer romance in The Girls Are Never Gone. So it's able to balance both of these different things in a really fantastic way and I really loved how The Girls Are Never Gone definitely leaves it up to the reader to kind of interpret what's happening around Dare and around the things that are happening and it's like one of those things where I have this line in my review where um, you know, it's these feelings of experiences that you can't really explain, but that keep piling up. And so I don't know necessarily how I feel about supernatural stuff, but it definitely makes you think and it makes Dare think, and that's the most important part of the book. So if you really love why mystery, why fantasy, why horror, like you definitely need to read this because it definitely talks about like on the surface, you know, things may look a different way, but then underneath they look way different. So if you love that kind of dichotomy between that, that's that this book is for you. The next one that I have is Year of the Reaper. Basically, Year of the Reaper features two of my favorite characters, I think, because one of them is like, it's kind of a grumpy sunshine-ish kind of thing. Um, I hesitate to use that trope because I think that the grumpiness in Year of the Reaper is incredibly nuanced in like the trauma and his past experiences. Basically, the sunshine character, she is a, um, she's an arc, she's a researcher. I can't remember if she's an archivist. Why do I think that she's an archivist? I'm, I'm looking this up right now. Historian. I was like, she archivist, historian. She's a historian, Lena. Lena's a historian and she is drawn into the, the world of Cass when an assassin tries to kill the queen. And I think Lena is a, just a visiting historian basically. But Cass um, is an ex-soldier. He's returning home. Or not a soldier. Yeah, no, he is. I'm just... I'm second guessing myself. He is a soldier who um, is just returning home from like three years basically um, because he was on a mission that was entrusted to him by the king but then he ends up going to jail and now he's just returning after three years so you know it's not necessarily like I, I don't know really how much it falls into like grumpy sunshine because I feel like I only really um see that referred to in romance books and this is very much like a YA fantasy book so take take that kind of vibe as you will. Um, what I loved about these were the characters okay the characters are so fantastic it's so if you love watching characters unfold to each other and like being able to recognize something in someone kind of instantaneously that is difficult to explain this is certainly the book for you and also there's a lot of mystery if you've read Makia's earlier books, so um, Isle of Stone, for example, or Song of the Abyss, you will know that Makia is fantastic at merging fantasy and mystery. And so these ones are so, like, so well done. The mixture is so fantastic in this one in the way that they're, like, 
pieces of, of the world and pieces of the mystery that are revealed to you in a seamless fashion and it just I, I if you love mystery fantasies this is it or fantasy mysteries this this is it for you the next one is a rush of wings which is another one of these crane um stories not crane stories swan stories but it's a little bit different so in, in a rush of wings first of all look at how gorgeous that cover is in a rush of wings Rorena is the main character and she ends up getting her her mom dies in a very supernatural sinister way i won't go into it because you know just read the book one day she ends up saving a stranger from a shipwreck and her mother miraculously comes back to life or returns from the dead but is definitely not the same mother that she was beforehand now though she then turns her brothers and the other stranger that she just rescued, um, not she, um, her resurrected mother, I guess, into swans. And so, um, Verena is going to have to figure out a way to break the curse. And what I really loved about this one is that Verena wants to learn magic, and her mother is like, no, you're too hot-headed, like, you're too temperamental, you can't learn magic, you don't have enough discipline or control. So Verena has magical powers, but she can't use them. She wasn't trained for it by her mother before her mother died because everyone kind of said, or her mother said, that she was too, like, emotional, I guess, or too angry. You know, dis she didn't have a lack, she didn't have enough emotional discipline, I guess. And so for me, that resonated super hard for me as someone who, you know, has very strong emotions and um, has a hard time coming down from like an emotional upheaval, whether it be like emotional happiness, all of the emotional highs. So not being able to learn magic because of this just resonated with me very deeply. I, because of that, Rain and I instantly like hit it off. I was kind of like, you are my spirit, like YA fantasy character. And the, the swans and all of that was fantastic the way that, um, Laura is able to weave in those elements. Also, there is a lot about Orena trying to figure out her own magic as well. And so that was fascinating to read. All in all, it's a fantastic read for anyone who loves these like swan story retellings. I've read a bunch now at this point because it's one of my favorite stories, but fan of that, fan of also um, girls who are told that they're like too hot headed basically. And then also girls who have to figure out their magical power because they're on their own. No one's like, no one's really teaching them and they can't share, they're not sure if they can trust everyone else once Orena makes a trip to Inverness. The next one is Little Thieves by Margaret Owen. Um, this is my Illumicrate edition, so my beautiful, beautiful stained edges. Um, I, uh, Little Thieves stole my heart. Vanya stole my heart and has not given it back, okay? Little Thieves, completely, I was blown away by Little Thieves. If you love kind of ruthless mercurial heroines who like to steal shiny things, Vanya's your girl, you gotta read Little Thieves. It is fantastic because, okay, first of all, I'll do a summary and then I'll just gush about how fantastic it is. Anyway, Vanya is, um, was adopted by the goddaughter, or she's the adopted goddaughter of death and fortune, and basically when she turns, I think, on her birthday, death and fortune asks which one of them are going to be, like, her not godmother, but like wh which one she's going to serve instead. But basically she doesn't want to pick because they're both her godmothers. And um, she, oh, it's also kind of a retelling of the goose girl. I don't know. It's like a retelling of the goose girl, but from the perspective of the girl who is the one who like switches the lives with the princess. Is it? That? Yes, that's what it is. I'm just trying to remember the goose girl story. Sorry, back to this. Um, and so she then decides to steal her future back by stealing the life, not like the physical life, but the lifestyle slash of the princess, basically, the princess whose name is Giselle. When she does that, by accidentally, she ends up um, stealing like a magical thing. I don't remember, like a magical artifact. And one of the gods, I can't remember the other one, but one of the gods curses her that she is going to become transform unless she makes amends she's going to transform into what she covets the most essentially some sort of you know permutation of whatever i've just said so now as she is going to be a t potentially charged for the thefts that she's also made she's kind of dealing with that she's dealing with like how does she make amends and she's also dealing with um all of her past actions which are coming back to call 
Why did I love this? Um, Vanya. Okay, I loved Vanya so much. She's a fantastic heroine because she's also like, what? I don't know how to give back the things that I've stolen. Let me just like throw some gold at it because I like gold, right? This is very much Vanya's perspective. When in reality, if you could have guessed, the whole point of the curse is like not monetarily. You know, it's not necessarily just like throw money at it, per se. Um, but I really loved also was that Little Thieves is hilarious. I remember looking up Little Thieves around release date and I think it was like number one in hilarious YA books. And I was like, hmm, interesting because it also deals with like sexual assault and trauma and it also deals with like elitism and classism and friendship betrayal and like all of those things. But it's also very funny. So like I get, I guess I get why it's there, but also like, hmm, interesting deals with all of those things but it is absolutely fantastic I'm so glad that we're going to get another book um in this with Vanya and like in this world I guess it's not necessarily direct okay I'm glad that we're able to that Vanya's story does not finish I guess but this is very much like a you can read this as a standalone 100% but it is fantastic also I loved how funny Margaret Owen is with the other characters as well. The banter, it is quick and it's witty, it is sharp. The banter within her, Vanya and of the other characters is really, really superb. And there's so many like hilarious, but also emotional really scenes. You know, I was like going from laughing to like crying on the inside, to being angry, to like all of the, this, this book wrung out the entire spectrum of my emotions kind of in one go. The next one is Jade Fire Gold by June Xiaotan. I have like three copies of this book. I like it so much. It's basically about, oh, I have the, the things in my limited edition basically. It's about An and Altan. An is trying to, An has magical powers and Altan is a lost heir and basically he's trying to like get back what was stolen from him. Um, and so when they meet, then Altan sees in An a path to reclaiming the throne. I'm reading it from the book, by the way, because she has magical powers. And An sees a way to finally unlock her past and understand her lethal magic abilities. So that's why it says, her destiny, his revenge. I enjoyed this book so much. I enjoyed watching these characters get to know each other. And I really, really enjoyed An's like whole character and her whole journey. Uh, I remember rereading my review way before filming this and I really love how June is able to kind of um, question and kind of explore this topic of power and monstrosity, especially in On and in her powers and like what makes a person powerful, what makes a person monstrous, what makes a person both. I felt like that theme was really beautifully explored in An's character in Jade Fire Gold and that's kind of why I loved it the most. And the last book which is coming out um, this year is Extasia by Claire Legrand. I'm a huge fan of Claire Legrand, like Saw Kill Girls is a fantastic book that I need everyone to read especially if you love queer, YA, fantasy slash horror slash thriller. Um, that one is amazing and so Extasia is fantastic because basically um, this the main character is going to become one of the saints in the um, community that she lives in and as soon as she is like embarking on this journey uh, so many things happen. I was gonna say all hell breaks loose. A lot of things happen basically as she's about to become a saint or like as she's on the path to sainthood someone I'm not gonna say who, uh, someone starts to try to question and tries to challenge her about what she thinks she knows about the community, her history, her family, like everything basically. And so that's one of the reasons why I loved Ecstasia the most. I love how it was so committed to exploring what happens when you kind of question your entire world and everything that is taught to you, everything that is told to you, all the stories. Um, her mother is gone. Um, I won't say why or how, but her mother is gone, so she has to reconcile with that and still like dealing with all of those kinds of issues. It is a fantastic, thrilling, thrilling, suspenseful novel about truth and about kind of community and solidarity and friendship and love and family and just if you really like kind of suspenseful YA fantasies, you definitely need to read it. It's one of those ones where like the last 
third of it I did not expect at all and threw me for a loop but in the best way I think um, and so Ecstasia is this one that I would highly recommend if you really love that kind of vibe. It's also um, has a similar vibe of an insular community where you're kind of in this insular community and how what happens when you start to question the world and the community. So if you love those vibes as well, definitely check this out because it's fantastic. It was on one of my highly anticipated book lists and it, it like lived up to it completely. I should go back to that list and like let everyone know how I felt about those books, but yes fantastic one. And that brings me to the end of my favorite 2021 YA fantasy releases, uh, part one, I guess. This was a, this was a long video. I hope that you were prepared for it before you started. I had a fantastic time filming this. These are some of my favorite ones and it was so fun and nostalgic to like talk about why I love them so much. So I hope you have a really great day. Please let me know below what some of your YA fantasy favorites were from 2021 and I will see you in the next part where I chat about um, sequels and or kind of like new, new to me YA fantasy favorites. Okay, bye!